Uh, hello, I'm Dorota. Hi, I'm Andrea. Today we're going to talk about bandits in recommender systems. And we have a friend with us, Joanna, who also wants to learn about this topic. Say hi. Hi. This tutorial is about how bandits are used in recommendation systems. Uh, the tutorial will be divided into three sections. Um, in the first, we'll talk about why exploration is important in recommendation systems and why bandits are needed. In the second part, we'll introduce classic bandit approaches. And in the third part, we'll talk about state-of-the-art bandit applications. All good till now, Joanna? Yes, all good. But why is the name bandit? That is a very weird name. Well, yeah, bandits come from a casino type metaphor where you have slot machines and the slot machines steal your money. So that's why they're bandits. But we'll talk more about that later. Okay, great. To start with, um, we want to introduce our two main protagonists. Um, this is exploration and exploitation. Joanna, imagine it's a Friday night and you want to pick a restaurant. Um, so we have a number of options in here. Um, I would, I would probably go for a Finnish one. I am from Chile, so I usually go to Chilean restaurants. No, 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 no. Try something new. Take it from a Colombian. Colombian food is really good. Try the ajiaco soup. It's amazing. Dorota, you are living in Finland. So what type of food do they have? Well, our classic dish is salmon soup with rye bread. Uh, you can also try some reindeer. A Rudolph? No, no, I want presents on Christmas. I will go for the Colombian restaurant to try something new. Great choice. It's not that different from Chile anyway, so... You'll do good. Well, this um, shows us a typical everyday life dilemma. Uh, and this is called exploration exploitation. So what happens? We have to decide. Do we want to stick to things that we like? Or do we want to try something new or explore new environments like a new restaurant? Let's dive deeper in two more examples where balancing exploration and exploitation is needed. For instance, uh, when a baby first wants to learn to walk, the baby really doesn't have uh, enough previous knowledge about uh, how to walk. And at first, the baby tries out many things. It uh, explores different types of actions. And when the baby falls, it's going to hurt. And when the f baby finally learns how to walk, the baby is happy. And this is called positive reinforcement or it can be viewed as positive reinforcement. Another good example is uh, when you're trying to teach a dog a new trick. When my dog was first, uh, well, when I was first trying to teach my dog, he, he cheated. So he used to sit and, and roll over and raise his paw no matter what the command. So this dog was exploring then? Exactly. He didn't know what I wanted. He tried different tricks until, well, through trial and error, he learned which trick command combination would lead to a treat. Okay, so I think I have read about this in psychology books. It's something about how human and animals learn from experience, right? Yes, it's called reinforcement learning and it's exactly inspired from this type of uh, works in psychology. In reinforcement learning, at least in computer science, we have two things, an agent and an environment. The agent interacts with its environment by performing actions and the environment offers positive rewards to reinforce good actions and negative feedback to discourage, for example, bad actions, let's say. Actions that do not lead uh, the agent towards its goal. In case of the baby trying to learn to walk and in case of the dog trying to get high, uh, a lot of treats, high rewards. Okay, so in this scenario, the baby and the dog are the agents. Yes, and the world and the owner of the dog are the environment, which are the ones that are providing the reinforcement feedback. Okay, so exploration is needed to learn. Yes, both the dog and the baby at first don't really know which actions are going to lead to this high uh, feedback or high positive rewards. Their environment is uncertain at first. They learn through exploration. We will talk more about reinforcement learning later. The main message here 
is that exploration is important when learning in this type of scenarios, which are actually sequential decision-making scenarios, where the agent, at first, doesn't really know very much about its environment. The environment is uncertain. The agent first has to explore to learn, but later has to use what it has learned. It has to exploit its knowledge to get more treats in the future. We will later see that balancing these competing goals of exploration and exploitation is really not that simple. Recommendation systems um, are actually applications that you come across um, probably every day in your life. Uh, so one application, for example, is Netflix that suggests different films to you. Other applications are commonly found in um, news recommendations online, um, recommendations for um, hotel bookings or um, journeys um, in general. Um, there are a lot of um, scenarios in recommendation systems that face uncertainty. Um, for example, um, your taste may change over time. Um, so you might require different type of recommendations. Um, also, the um, there are also dynamic changes in the catalog. So you know there may be new additions um, to the Netflix catalog. So you might also um, take that into consideration uh, when designing your recommender system. Um, there's also the cold start problem. So this happens when we have new users um, who start using uh, your recommendation system and we don't know anything about them. Um, so we try, we have to try to figure out how to um, recommend new items to them, what their tastes are like. Um, also, things change very fast in general. Um, there are different political events, um, different times of the year. So you might want to buy something different around Christmas time as opposed to summertime. So all these things um, require a level of exploration exploitations. Hmm, I understand uh, then. So recommender systems have a lot of situations where they lack data to make decisions. But how can recommender system explore? What does this mean for a recommendation system? Well, as we just saw, recommender systems face different types of uncertainty in dynamic and fast-paced environments. They need to learn quickly and adapt. Just like the baby and the dog, recommender systems can be seen as agents that learn from their interactions with users. From this point of view, the recommender system or agent offers an item suggestion to a user and the user then provides feedback, usually in the form of a rating. This rating can be viewed as the reinforcement feedback or reward. The recommender system's goal is then to maximize the amount of positive reward feedback it can collect over several interactions. So how does the exploration exploitation dilemma fit in this picture? Well, throughout this interaction, when deciding which item to recommend, the recommender system faces two choices. On the one hand, does it offer an item suggestion to try to best satisfy the user? That is, does it exploit its current knowledge about user preferences, which is found in the user model, to try to offer the best known item suggestion? Or, well, on the other hand, does it offer an item suggestion to try to explore what other preferences the user could have? That is, does it suggest an item uh, it is not really very sure if a user would like in order to learn something new about the user? But if it's not sure about uh, if the user will like the item, what happens if the user hates it? It's a gamble, but it's a similar gamble like when you are trying to decide which restaurant to go to. So in, in the case of the restaurants, what if you had decided to explore and try the reindeer at the Finnish restaurant? What if you had loved the reindeer? If you had not tried, if you would, are not willing to try, how, how would you know if you like it or not? So if you had hated the dish, well, you would learn to stay away from it in the future. This still counts as very valuable knowledge. With exploration, the recommender system is really trying to learn about user preferences. Even if the user gives the system bad feedback or, say, a bad reward, this is still very valuable information to learn what the user likes or doesn't like. 
All this new knowledge can help the recommender system make better choices in the future, even if it involves some short-term risk or sacrifice. Alternatively, if the recommender system decides to always exploit, it could get stuck making bad recommendations in the case that it lacks enough information about user preferences to make good decisions. So by trying the Colombia restaurant, am I exploring or exploiting? Really, you're doing a little bit of both. An item recommendation doesn't have to be purely exploitative or purely exploratory. Products can lie in a spectrum. For instance, the Colombian restaurant was somewhat outside of your usual preferences, but it's not as far as the Finnish restaurant. Trying the Colombian restaurant can still help you learn something about your own food preferences. All in all, there are many different strategies that uh, we can try to determine how and when it makes sense to explore or exploit. For now, what is important to understand is that When making an item recommendation, the recommender system faces a fundamental choice. Should it exploit to better serve users now, or should it explore to gain valuable knowledge and perform better in the future? Let's have a look um, at some of the exam use cases and examples um, of when to use exploration and exploitation in recommender systems. Um, so one of the early applications was news recommendation, uh, for example, Yahoo news recommendation and also um, or online services like Facebook um, as well. Um, so what happens is that um, news is recommended to you based on the type of news that you read, the types of topics that you're interested in. Uh, but sometimes, and this would be called um, exploitation. But sometimes the system might want to recommend to you something that is kind of similar to what you like, but at the same time a bit different to maybe encourage you to read different type of news. So it would be called exploitation, uh, exploration. Um, so, for example, if you only read news about uh, motorsports, it will only send you recommendations about um, F1 racing, maybe, or uh, other car racing um, events. But you might think that if you just read about different types of sports, maybe you might also be interested in reading news about football um, or rugby playing um, and so on. So that would be a type of exploration in terms of recommending you new type of news. Another type of application is online shopping. At a certain point, Amazon was testing a very interesting service called Amazon Stream. This service offered users like an infinite scroll of products, where each of the products would have both exploitative and exploratory characteristics. The, the main idea here was to kind of simulate this experience of window shopping. Basically, it's like when you go to the mall and you don't really know uh, exactly what you're, you're going to buy. You don't have the intention really of shopping and you're not looking for something specific. You're just browsing around or kind of open to the idea of stumbling into something that could be interesting for you to buy. With a similar goal in mind, this goal of kind of supporting or encouraging item discovery and this Uh, idea of supporting users in finding different types of novel products within your catalog. Uh, Spotify has this service called Spotify Weekly. So the Spotify Weekly is kind of an email that Spotify sends you every week, which basically has a playlist of songs that are kind of different uh, of, from your usual listening habits. They uh, encourage you to explore new types of genres within the catalog. So Amazon and Spotify both have dedicated spaces for users to explore new items, right? Well, yes. Although this is not always the case, it can be that by having dedicated spaces that are just more geared towards discovery, users could be more open to exploring new things and they could also be more forgiving to potentially bad item recommendations. It is just important to remember that different types of users are just not always open to exploration or are open to exploration in different ways and in different moments. Okay, that makes sense. Another type of application is computational advertising. 
For example, as an advertiser, you have only very limited space to put adverts on a computer screen. However, advertisers gain revenue, the more ads are clicked. So there is, of course, trade-off between collecting information about click-through rates or offering ads known to perform well. Exploiting too much could lead to many clickbait-type ads or to filter bubble situations. However, incorporating exploration can lead to short-term monetary loss. The question is, how much money are we willing to risk today to potentially increase our earnings in an unclear future? Um, another application is tourism. Um, so here, um, if you use a specific um, service um, to find new places to visit or new type, type of hotels to go to, um, it will try to recommend the ones that probably the type of hotels you normally go to um, just to be on the safe side. So there will be um, exploitation. Um, but it might also try to recommend a new type of places or new type of hotels that will be maybe cheaper or more expensive or in a different location that you might not necessarily be um, satisfied with in the future. So there will be exploration. Obviously, there is this trade-off for the um, uh, booking agency or tourism agency that if they recommend places um, that you're not satisfied with in the future, you might stop using the service. So they might uh, towards um, exploitation of your current interests um, or preferences. Dorota, you raise a really important point here. You can't really send the user to a random hotel for the sake of exploration. These type of explorations have a really high cost and really high risk for the user if they go badly. So you really have to be careful in certain applications on how and when to explore. Wow, there are a lot of applications. Yeah, and there are a lot more. <laughs> I'm curious about how do you both get into this exploration and exploitation topic? Um, well, I initially started working um, in the area of reinforcement learning from the theoretical perspective. Um, however, it, that was during my PhD studies. And after my PhD, I moved to a research group that was doing more applied um, research in the areas of human computer interaction, information retrieval. Um, and this is where I learned about um, an area of surgical exploratory research where um, the same kind of principles apply, um, where you want to recommend to um, the user um, articles um, that they might be interested in based on their initial search query, but at the same time, you know, the users might not know very well the area of search. So you want also to be sure that they are satisfied with the items or documents recommended to them. You might also recommend articles related to the search query, but not precisely on topic. So, for example, if you do search for machine learning, um, it might also recommend to you articles about computer vision or artificial intelligence. They are kind of close related to the, um, to the field of machine learning. Another application that we worked on involved a radar interface, you can see in the slide. In this interface, keywords were extracted from a given database of documents and they were displayed um, on the interface with respect to how important they were to a given query. Users could vote um, or give feedback to given keywords by moving, uh, by moving them closer um, to the center of the interface, which meant that they were of high interest to the user, or they could move them further away from the center or even, or even move them away from the interface altogether, indicating that they have no interest in this particular keywords. Um, this allowed the um, algorithm, again based on Bandit's algorithm, to um, figure out or to learn from user feedback which areas to exploit and which areas to explore more. I kind of stumbled into this topic when I was doing my master thesis on diversity in recommendation systems. And in, in this area, what usually happens is that there is this trade-off between accuracy and diversity. So uh, what uh, approaches try to do is that they notice that users have different types of preferences inside their user profile. 
so not to affect so much accuracy, but also provide diversity, they try to offer items that kind of cover the different user preferences that are already found inside the user profile. However, there is this idea that you can uh, see diversity in items that are farther away or outside the user profile, novel items. So this diversity in novel products, different products from what the user usually likes, I called uh, exploratory diversity and uh, the products that cover uh, different preferences within the user profile, I kind of uh, termed that exploitative diversity. And kind of uh, this led me to exploration and exploitation trade-off, and then that led me to reinforcement learning and that to bandit. And now I'm doing my PhD on this topic. Hope you enjoyed our small discussion of explore exploit applications in recommendation systems. If you can think of other applications, please share them with us in the online forum. And before you go to the next section, hey, take a break. You deserve it. So far, we have discussed the importance of balancing exploration and exploitation to learn in interactive sequential decision-making settings, such as reinforcement learning and recommender systems, especially when in these settings, there is a decision-making agent that is actually facing an unknown or an uncertain environment. The field of reinforcement learning actually provides us important tools to address the problem of balancing exploration and exploitation, specifically through solutions that face the multi-arm bandit problem. Multi-arm bandits can be seen as a simpler but powerful instantiation of reinforcement learning. And in recent years, recommender system works have taken inspiration from bandit solutions. This tutorial will provide a strong emphasis on introducing classic bandit techniques. After this, we will show examples of how the ideas behind the classic bandit techniques have been adopted and applied to recommender systems to address the problem of balancing exploration and exploitation. The name Martin and Bandits comes from a casino metaphor. Imagine there is a gambler in front of a row of slot machines, sometimes referred to as one arm bandits. The gambler has to decide which machines to play, how many times to play each machine, and in which order to play them, and whether to continue with the current machine or try a different machine. In the multi arm bandit setting, a slot machine has k arms or actions. We are limited to a fixed number of trials or steps. At each step, Pick an arm to play and observe the reward provided by the machine. After each play, you need to decide whether to play the same arm or whether to try a different one in the hope of receiving a better reward. The goal of the play is to maximize the total sum of rewards after a fixed number of trials. Arms are stochastic and the rewards produced by each arm come from a fixed distribution. The arms don't change, meaning that the reward distributions don't change over time. The number of arms is also fixed throughout a given set of trials. Note that the reward distributions are known to the gambler. Also note that at each step, the gambler can only see what the payoff is for the arm that was played and doesn't receive any information about the other arms. This type of feedback is called banded feedback. This means that by playing or sampling arms, the gambler's decision directly influences the data he can see or not see to later make inferences about the unknown distributions. Let's expand a bit on the definition of the goal for the bandit task. We have mentioned that the goal is to maximize the total sum of rewards. Nevertheless, this goal should really be viewed as maximizing or minimizing a value called return, which can be viewed as a function of the collected rewards. For instance, the return can be defined as the total regret, and we want to minimize regret. At each step or play, the regret is the difference between the reward that could have been received if the optimal arm had been played and the reward that was actually received for the arm that was actually played. Regret quantifies the opportunity loss. In this tutorial, we won't be focusing on regret, but it is important for you to know 
that regret is often used in bandit theory to define theoretical guarantees on the performance of a bandit algorithm, for instance, to bound the worst case performance of an algorithm. Regret helps compare an algorithm's performance versus the optimal strategy. In general, there are other goals that can be optimized, such as to maximize average reward or to maximize the percentage of times that we actually choose an optimal action, among others. We will later see that for many banded approaches, making decisions requires to incorporate some randomness. As a result, both the banded task and the banded algorithm are generally stochastic. So, we actually want to measure the expected performance of the banded algorithm or agent when interacting with the banded task or environment. This means we are measuring the expected return. To do this, we will assume that when evaluating an algorithm, we will execute a certain number of episodes, which are complete agent environment interactions for the T trials or the time horizon, the complete time horizon. Next, we will aggregate the episode results to plot what are called learning curves, which are actually show the expected return at each step over the T trials. Not to worry, we will see more examples later. Try to play against the bandit. How many coins can you collect? So, how did it go? Share experience with us on the forum. Here are some questions for you to reflect on in relation to your experience. So, back to the casino. Let's imagine we are playing and we can choose between arm A and arm B. So, randomly, let's say we pick arm A. It gives us $5. Okay, next we pick B. It gives us zero, five. Okay, let's play B now. Zero, zero. Let's try A again. Okay, it seems that arm B is not giving us any payoff at all. And arm A is giving us five always. So let's just stick to arm A. Well, if we actually had looked at the probability payoff, then we would have noticed that arm A always gives 5 as payoff, and that arm B gives us $60 50% of the time. So on average, it would have given us $30 per round. In the long run, B would have been a better choice. It's just that our exploration strategy wasn't good enough to actually figure out that arm B was actually the better choice. As you can see, we need to explore to gather more information, but we also need to exploit, to use what we have learned and choose the best action as often as possible to get high rewards. If we only exploit, our knowledge could be wrong, and we can be mistakenly choosing a suboptimal action even if we get some short-term rewards. Alternatively, even if exploration could sacrifice immediate reward, it can also help to refine the agent's knowledge. It would help improve the agent's chances of finding the true optimal action, and it could help increase long-term reward. However, if we explore too much, we could lose out on known rewards. Sometimes, the best long-term strategy may involve some sacrifices in the short run. Overall, a balance is needed between the competing goals of exploration and exploitation. There are multiple scenarios where there is a need to balance exploration and exploitation. For example, one of the first applications of banded algorithms was in clinical trials where doctors uh, or clinicians had to decide which drug um, to trial first or to decide which drug has the highest chance of being successful or fail. Another application is financial portfolio design where an investor has to decide which shares to invest in um, or which shares are most likely to give um, the highest rewards as opposed to the ones who potentially at some point might give you higher rewards but can be quite risky. A-B testing is a very popular application of banded algorithms. Here um, we have two versions of the same system and we have to decide 
which version the users would prefer most. A similar application to A-B testing is parameter search, uh, which again is very uh, popular in system design where, or algorithm design, where we have to decide which parameter setting um, will give us the best performing system or the system that the users like most. In epidemic control, policymakers need to decide which are the best interventions to apply to control a disease spread. Interventions such as school closures, social distancing, vaccinations, etc. To design intervention plans, one approach is to develop disease models or simulate environments where exploration and exploitation based algorithms can be used to find optimal intervention strategies. So, how do we balance the trade off between exploration and exploitation? Let's first look at the strategy similar to when we were choosing between arm A and arm B. In that example, we decided to first test out each arm. We wanted to see what type of rewards the arms would provide us. Then we decided to stick to one of the arms, the one that we thought was the best. This actually belongs to a family of strategies that are called explore then exploit. In explore then exploit approaches, we will first have an exploration phase for n steps, and then we are going to exploit. To explore, we will just think about it as choosing an action at random. After the n steps, we will then just choose the action that we think is the best at that time, that is, we're going to exploit. During the whole interaction, at each step, according to the feedback that we're going to be observing about each uh, arm, about the reward, we will be continuously updating our knowledge about the actions, about the arms. Now, all we need to do is keep track of which action is best. For this, we will use function q, called the action value function. Q will give us, for each arm A, an estimate on what we should expect the reward is going to be if we were to play that arm A. As we view new rewards, as we observe new rewards for A, Q is updated. Then, the best known action, or the greedy action, will be the one that has the highest Q value. For now, a simple way to estimate the value for an action is just to use the average of the rewards that we have seen for that action. Intuitively, this basically means that we are going to think that an action is better than another if we have observed higher rewards for it on average. So, we will just use the empirical mean, mu sub a, as the estimated value for an action, which is just the mean of the rewards r that have been observed for that action. If at time t we have observed n sub a rewards for an action, we just add the observed rewards r and divide by n sub a. For now, let's just think of exploration as random action selection and exploitation as picking the arm with the highest sample mean. This is not to say that this is always the case. In practice, the strategy that you use to explore or the strategy that you use to exploit will vary according to your application. There are many ways to define n and as a result, many variations to the explore then exploit strategy. One approach is just to explore each action once and then exploit. Another called epsilon first defines n in proportion to the time horizon. This way, epsilon can be viewed as the percentage of the time horizon that will be assigned to the exploration phase. There are other examples of variations that can arise. For example, approaches that set n as a function of the time horizon. In general, though we are combining exploration and exploitation with this approach, it can have some issues. One is that it can have very bad performance during the exploration phase. Also, if we don't perform enough exploration, when exploiting, the approach could get stuck picking a suboptimal action. Still, even if these seem like simple approaches, they can be very useful in many situations. Next, we will try to analyze a bit more how these approaches perform, and we're going to build up towards more complex banded approaches. So let's test some of these approaches, some of these algorithms. To do this, we're going to use the 10 arm test bed, which was first introduced by Sutan and Barto in their Introduction to Reinforcement Learning book. Very highly recommended book. Basically, the test bed follows some rules to generate banded environments at random. 
Each randomly generated bandit task will have 10 arms, where each arm will provide rewards according to our normal distribution. This distribution will have mean Q star A and variance 1. Note that Q star of A represents the true mean payoff of an arm. Each Q star of A will be selected according to another normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1. So basically, following these rules, we can generate different instantiations of this 10 arm banded task. Now, we are interested in measuring the performance of an algorithm when facing a banded environment generated by the 10 arm testbed when interacting with it for 1000 time steps. Because we are interested on average performance, we will generate 2000 instances of the banded task and average results over the 2000 episodes of complete interactions between the algorithm and the banded environment. So now let's see some results. In this graph, we are comparing an algorithm that chooses arms at random. The other algorithm is a greedy approach. Then we have an explore once, which is going to select each action once before exploiting. And then we have an explore once that has actually no updates when it starts to exploit. So basically, our Q values are not going to be updated as it observes rewards in the exploitation phase. We use this last approach just for the purpose of comparison. What we are plotting is the percentage of times the algorithm chooses the optimal action at a particular time step. For instance, because we have 10 arms to choose from, it makes sense that, by chance, if the algorithm chooses actions at random, it will find the optimal action one-tenth of the time. This is why if we average the performance of our random algorithm across the episodes, at each time step, 10% of those episodes found the optimal action by chance. Results show that just by exploring each action once, we are already getting an improvement over our greedy algorithm. If we compare explore once with updates and without, we see that even though explore once starts exploiting, it keeps improving. This is because as it receives new rewards, the best known arm can keep changing, the Q values keep changing, until they kind of converge and then the performance of the algorithm plateaus. Here we are comparing a number of epsilon first algorithms, each with different sizes for their exploration phase. Let's focus on the one that had the longest exploration phase, n equal to 500. We can see that it has the most chances of finding the optimal action in the long run towards the last steps, but because it was the one who had the longest exploration phase, in the initial steps it made the most sacrifices in regards to rewards. If we compare its average performance in terms of the total sum of rewards, compared to the other approaches, it was the one that accumulated the least amount of reward. In general, we do see the issues we spoke about before related to explore-exploit approaches. We can see that because n is fixed, solutions that explore the least can lock onto a suboptimal action and after that exploit it forever. Also, we can see that approaches can do quite badly in their exploration phase. Maybe what we want is a more continuous exploration that is more spread out over time. This is where Epsilon Greedy comes in. In the Epsilon Greedy policy, imagine you have a coin and that the coin is a biased coin. So 1 minus Epsilon percent of the time, it will turn out to be, let's say, heads and heads is exploit and epsilon amount of the times it's explore. So when you flip this coin, you will figure out if you're going to perform an action that exploits or perform an action that explores. Epsilon can take values between zero and one. In practice, a typical value for epsilon is 0 0.1, but really this is a parameter that just needs to be tuned. So how does it perform? Here we see two graphs that compare three epsilon greedy approaches. The epsilon greedy approach with epsilon zero is really just the equivalent to the greedy approach. As expected, the greedy method got stopped performing suboptimal actions. It found the optimal action in less than 40% of the episodes. Both algorithms that incorporated some exploration actually got better over time. The approach with the highest epsilon, epsilon 0 0.1, 
actually finds more often the optimal action earlier, but in the long run, the most it would select it would be around 90% of the time. In other words, a high value epsilon might find the optimal action earlier, as it would do a lot of exploration, but it would not select the optimal action as often in the long run. The algorithm will always have a certain percentage of exploration. The epsilon greedy algorithm with epsilon 0.01 improves slowly, and at some point, far in the future, it would find the optimal action. When it does find this optimal action, it would perform even better than epsilon 0.1, as it would do a better job at exploiting. However, in this setting, with a limited time horizon of 1000 time steps, the algorithm with smaller epsilon does not explore enough to find the optimal action. So these observations teach us a few things. One of these is that it's good to have early exploration, but in the long run, we want to exploit more the knowledge we have obtained. A simple way to encourage early exploration is called optimistic initialization. The intuition is simple. We assume that actions are good until we find out they're not. In this case, we are plotting two epsilon greedy algorithms. One of them is optimistic. And from the start, it believes that the estimated value for actions is five, which is actually quite high in this setting. As a result, actions are tried out at first several times. As we said before, an action is good until it's proven otherwise. In the plot, we can see that the optimistic initialization boosts exploration at the start. It does perform worse in the first time steps, but it also discovers more often the optimal action. This intuition of optimistic initialization can be used in combination with other approaches, not only epsilon greedy, and it actually can be quite useful. However, it does come with a parameter that we need to set. We also have one more issue. We would prefer to prioritize exploitation as our knowledge improves, not just encourage early exploration. So what else can we do? We can assign a decay schedule for epsilon. So over time, as we gain more knowledge, we explore less and less. In general, many bandit approaches have some parameter that will help control exploration. And these parameters can have some type of schedule, which will help achieve better results. For instance, in recommender systems, we face environments that change over time. In these cases, we might want to have a schedule that ever so often restarts its exploration efforts after a decay. To summarize, we have discussed several variations of approaches that switch between pure exploration and pure exploitation. But can we think of an approach that doesn't do this type of very strict switching? Also, can we improve our exploration strategy? It seems a bit naive at the moment. For instance, right now we are choosing equally between actions, but should we keep exploring actions that we have already seen that are really bad? What if we choose arms in proportion to the estimated value? That is, what if we define a probability for choosing each arm, as you can see in the slide? If an action has high estimated value, maybe we want to pick it more often. But we still want to allow all actions to have some chance to be chosen in order to keep learning. So here we have one initial formula where the estimated value of each arm can be viewed as a weight or preference. The higher the estimated value, the more likely an action is to be selected. Now let's refine our formula a bit to add some desirable features. We ex exponentially rescale our value estimates to really emphasize that higher value actions are more desirable. But we also add a parameter to allow us to control these probabilities. This approach is called Boltzmann exploration or softmax exploration and it's one of a family of approaches called exponential weighting strategies. Note that the idea of choosing actions in proportion to probability is called probability matching and we will later see other approaches that apply this type of strategy. The parameter tau is called the temperature parameter. At high temperatures, as the value of tau moves closer to infinity, the algorithm would choose actions more randomly, as action probabilities would be more similar. For low temperatures, that is, as the value of tau moves closer to zero, there will be greater difference between the higher valued actions and the lower. 
and the approach would tend to act greedily. This is the arms with highest estimated value are more likely to be selected. This just means that the tau allows some control over a continuum between exploitation and exploration. However, for both Boltzmann exploration and, and for epsilon greedy, we have configurable parameters that need to be tuned. This can be very tricky. So, is there an approach that is more, in a way, adaptive? A tip can be found in one of the disadvantages of, of both e-greedy and Boltzmann exploration. What happens if the initial reward for potential good actions are low? Well, in the long run, these actions can be underexplored as we have underestimated the value. So maybe we should consider both the estimated value of an action as well as how confident we are in the estimates. Let's dive deeper into this idea. Up to now, we have been using our estimate of the sample mean to help us keep track of which actions are better than others. However, we haven't really considered yet how confident we are about this estimate. So let's do that. Let's assume that our action value estimate lies within some confidence interval that we can adjust based on the data we have collected. So a confidence interval is a range of values within which we are fairly sure that our sample mean lies in with a certain probability. The intuition is that when we have less data, we are more uncertain where the real sample mean actually is. So what, what value it actually takes. So this confidence interval is actually very wide. As we get more samples or information, our confidence grows. Our estimates start getting better and better. So this confidence interval is going to shrink to zoom into the values where the most certain our true sample mean actually is. So now, how do we use this information? The upper confidence bound algorithm, or UCB, practices optimism in the face of uncertainty by prioritizing arms that have the highest potential of being the best. To do this, the approach basically decides to always play the arm with the highest upper confidence bound, where this upper bound is the highest value from our confidence interval, the highest payoff we think an action could give us, even if we are uncertain. We gamble on arms that have the highest potential and we think optimistically from there on. The intuition is that the more uncertain we are about the reward of an action, the more important it is to explore it. So, given the confidence intervals on the slide, UCB would play arm 1 and with some luck it could do better than arm 2. However, the algorithm would really stop exploring arm 3, as the best payoff arm 3 could potentially give us is pretty bad compared to the worst payoff of arm 2. There really is no point in exploring actions that have already proven to be suboptimal. We can view UCB more as a general idea that combines two factors. One would be more related to exploitation, which is actually our reward estimate, our Q value, and the other would be more uh, geared towards encouraging exploration, which would be this upper confidence bound or kind of a measure of uncertainty that would help us guide our exploration efforts towards uh, actions that have the most potential to be good. So we have this intuition of combining what we currently know, our knowledge, plus the idea of uncertainty, and this could basically lead us to uncertainty-guided exploration, opposed to the random exploration that we had from before, which is really an unguided intuition of exploration. Next, we will see that this uh, general idea is actually implemented in different ways, and we will now see one approach uh, that implements the UCB idea. UCB1 is an algorithm that first plays each arm once to get an initial estimate and then plays an arm that maximizes the formula that you can see in the slide. The equation considers exploitation by favoring arms with the highest value estimates with the highest sample mean and as well considers exploration by favoring arms for which we know less information about in comparison to other arms. If we focus on the exploration factor, 
we see that in the numerator, we have the total number of played arms, capital N. And in the denominator, we have the total number of plays for that particular arm, let's say arm J. If we play arms different than J, capital N will grow, which means our exploration factor for J will increase. But as we get more samples for J, our denominator will increase, which means our exploration factor for J will decrease. We can see with this approach that actions will eventually be selected. An action's exploration factor grows with time as capital N increases. This means that if we imagine an infinite time horizon, then actions would eventually be sampled infinitely. The key really is that actions with lower value estimates that have been tried fairly frequently, actions that we are fairly certain are suboptimal, they will be selected with less and less frequency over time. Some implementations include a parameter, in this case C, that can control the expiration factor. This parameter can have a schedule similar to the decaying epsilon greedy we saw before. It is important to consider that our measure for the upper bound is an estimate because we're doing sampling. More specifically, UCB1 uses Hobding's inequality to establish an upper bound for the empirical mean, for our Q. Though we're not going to go through the details, what is important for you to know is that this is a loose upper bound, as Hovden's inequality does not make any prior assumptions about the underlying reward distributions. It's a general bound. So naturally, there are different ways to estimate the upper bound. And towards this goal, several UCB type variants have been proposed. For instance, UCB V replaces Hovden's inequality by Bernstein's inequality. Also, in addition to the empirical mean estimate, UCB V uses variance estimates. There is another version that is called UCB tuned that also uses variance estimates. Some approaches incorporate different types of parameters to be tuned, such as UCB2, UCB V, and others. There are other ways to achieve better results, which is basically by incorporating prior knowledge. By making different assumptions about a specific banded problem, we create approaches that provide better results tailored to problem-specific characteristics. In other words, we can try to make assumptions about rewards and their distributions to achieve more accurate estimates for our upper bound. For instance, KLUCB assumes rewards are bounded and uses kullback liebler divergence to achieve a tighter confidence interval. On its side, UCB normal has been proposed for banded settings that have normally distributed rewards, and GP UCB was proposed for rewards guided by Gaussian processes. Bayes UCB considers a Bayesian point of view and relies on quantiles of the posterior distribution to estimate uncertainty. All in all, the main message here is that the UCB family is quite big. A wide variety of approaches have been proposed, mostly aiming to have better estimates for the upper confidence bound in different problem settings. Great, you've made it this far. As a reward, here, a cat video. Let's summarize quickly what we have seen. We have k actions or arms, each having an unknown stochastic distribution. From now on, we will use r sub a as notation for this unknown stochastic distribution. We have defined an action value function q to help us make decisions. And really, what q wants is to estimate the expected reward of r sub a. This is because it makes sense for us to want to play actions that offer the highest expected reward. To estimate this, we have defined Q as the sample mean. Then we use Q to help us decide which is the best next action to do. That is, we use Q as the base for our action selection strategy. And we have defined different approaches for this. One switches between exploitation, which means it chooses the action that has the maximum Q value, and exploration, in this case, choosing a random action. Next, we looked at UCB. 
which is based on the idea of optimism in the face of uncertainty. This approach combines the knowledge that we currently have, that is, the knowledge found in the Q-value, with the measurement of uncertainty to incentivize exploration. Finally, we looked at probability matching, where we would select actions in proportion to their probability of being the best action. Because we're choosing actions based on probabilities, this adds a component of randomness, where all actions have a certain chance to be chosen, and thereby we support exploration. As we can see, Q plays an important role, and so far we have looked at estimating expected payoffs from a frequentist point of view. We have made no assumptions about the reward distributions, about their properties, about their structure. So what if we did have some prior knowledge about how the rewards are generated, some prior knowledge about R sub A? There is a second school of thought for statistical inference that we haven't considered yet that could help us out to incorporate in a more explicit way prior knowledge. So now let's see what happens when we consider a Bayesian point of view to value function estimation. With the Bayesian approach, what we want is to model explicitly our uncertainty about Q, and we're going to do this using probabilities. Let's see an example. Here we have three arms. For each, we have a probability that expresses our beliefs about the possible values Q could have. In this case, for all arms, we believe Q is bounded between 0 and 1. For the green arm, we believe that all possible values for Q are equally likely. For the blue arm, we believe it has an expected payoff close to 0 0.5, but we are not very certain. And for the red arm, we are much more certain that Q is close to 0 0.8, and thus this probability is more peaked. In short, these probabilities express our beliefs about Q and where its possible value could be. This means that the spread of each probability actually reflects our uncertainty about where the expected reward for an arm is. It does not reflect an estimate on the variance of the true rewards. It is really just our uncertainty about Q. Now, how do we update these beliefs about Q after we see some samples of the reward payoffs for actions? We can just use a Bayesian update to get a posterior probability and then use this posterior to help us decide which is the next best action that we should do. So before we see any data, we reflect our initial beliefs about Q in a prior probability. And in each step, we update our beliefs based on observed data to get a posterior probability. For example, let's imagine we played the blue arm three times and that for all of these plays, we received a reward of 0 0.3. We might want to reflect this in our posterior probability by shifting it as shown on the slide. Finally, this new posterior probability becomes our new prior belief for the blue arm on our next step and so forth. This general idea is used by several bandit strategies, one of which is one of the oldest called Thompson sampling. Thompson sampling or posterior sampling was initially introduced in 1933 probably the first banded algorithm, and has recently increased in popularity due to promising empirical results. We're now going to review Thompson sampling specifically for the case of Bernoulli bandits. In this setting, rewards are generated by Bernoulli distributions. So imagine each arm is basically a bias coin that is heads with a certain success probability, P sub A. As a result, rewards are one or zero, heads or tails. Let's view them as one for success and zero for failure. For this setting, it is common practice to define the prior with a beta distribution due to their conjugacy properties. Basically, it makes the math easier. The structure of the beta distribution is defined by two parameters, alpha and beta. And to start, it is common to use a flat uninformative prior by setting both alpha and beta to one. With this, all the possible values for Q are equally likely before we see any data. Now, after we see data, this prior distribution is pretty easy to update. Basically, alpha and beta are counts of successes or failures that we are observing in the rewards. We simply have to update these counts following the procedure shown on the slide to update our beliefs about Q. Finally, we use our updated posterior beliefs about Q to select the next action. 
we're going to do this with probability matching, and we will discuss this in the next slide. Thompson sampling applies one of the simplest ways to use the posterior distribution. Basically, we're going to generate our Q values by randomly sampling from the posterior. After this, all we really need to do is use the generated Q values to pick the next action. We pick the action that has the highest Q value. On the slide, we see an example where after randomly sampling from our posteriors, for our green arm, we got a Q value of 0.1, for the blue, we got 0.75, and for the red, we got 0.2. In this case, we're going to choose the blue arm as our next action to play. In a nutshell, we first generate a random belief about our Q values based on the posterior, and then we act greedily with respect to these values. In this way, the approach applies probability matching. We are playing actions according to their probability of being optimal. At this stage, we have seen several types of approaches based on different ways to do exploration. It could be random or uncertainty guided. We have seen different ways of estimating the Q values from a frequentist and Bayesian perspective. We have also seen different setups for the bandits for instance, optimistic initial values and different parameter schedules that the exploration parameters could have. We have learned about how to evaluate these approaches and how to interpret learning curves and how different variants for bandits arise. However, this is still not a complete picture. There are also several variants for the multi-arm bandit problem itself basically adjusting to different problem settings. These variants arise from alterations or extensions to the classical definition of the problem and its assumptions. For example, in the multiple play bandit, we don't only play one arm. For non-stationary bandits, reward distributions can change over time. In adversarial bandits, rewards are no longer stochastic. They are set by an adversary. In the full feedback setting, we can see the rewards for all arms, regardless if we played the arm or not, and there are many, many more variants. An important variation, especially for recommender systems, is the contextual bandit. In this setting, arms generate rewards depending on a context, which can change at each step. The algorithm, in addition to reward feedback, receives information about the next context, which basically provides useful knowledge about how arms will generate rewards in the next step. For instance, in recommender systems, the reward or rating we receive about items depends on the user. In a contextual bandit setting, the algorithm could receive at each step in the form of a context information about which user will receive the next recommendation. Let's dive deeper into the contextual bandit setting. As we mentioned, rewards are going to be generated depending on a context X. In other words, R sub A generates a noisy reward value depending on an input context X. Under this view, it makes sense for our Q to estimate the expected reward of an arm, given the context X. Let's review a concrete approach that addresses the contextual bandit setting, but for linear rewards, called lin UCB. In this setting, the context x is a d-dimensional vector, and r sub a is a linear function that generates rewards based on a linear relationship between a context vector x and a parameter vector theta sub a. Note that each arm has their own coefficient or parameter vector theta. Given this prior knowledge about linear rewards, it makes sense for q to also be a linear function that given input x uses an estimate of the theta coefficients, theta hat, to estimate an action's expected reward. Unsurprisingly, Lin UCB selects actions according to a UCB strategy. The upper bound combines exploitation by using Q and a measure of uncertainty over Q, which we will define as the function S. As can be seen on the equation, the approach defines a parameter alpha to control exploration. To be precise, LinUCB builds a prediction model for each arm using linear regression. Observed data per arm is used as training data, where observed contexts 
are used as the input features and the observed rewards are interpreted as label data. As seen on the slide, the matrix D is used to store the observed context and the vector C to store the collected rewards associated to those contexts. We can also see on the slide an equation for how the approach defines theta hat and the prediction error S, which can also be interpreted as a standard deviation. In short, LinUCB is a general bandit approach for a contextual bandit setting with linear rewards. The presented variant assumes arms generate rewards independently, so the approach uses observed context and rewards as training data for linear prediction models per each action or arm to define each action's Q value. In addition, the solution defines measurements of uncertainty over the predictions and applies a UCB strategy to select the next action. This approach was initially proposed for a recommendation systems use case. So let's finally see how bandits are used in recommender systems. LinUCB was originally proposed for online news recommendation, specifically for Yahoo News, and since then it has become a very common baseline. The general motivation was to address the multiple cold start challenges of this use case. For example, news changes frequently, content popularity changes over time, and there are constantly new users coming into the site. So to address this, Yahoo wanted a solution that would help them select the main news article of the Yahoo News front page to maximize user click feedback. This news story could be selected from a small pool of articles that were pre-selected by editors. In the example on the slide, there were 32 possible articles, but this pool could change over time. In this scenario, our arms are the candidate news articles and their expected reward is their click-through rate. As we mentioned, the pool of candidate articles can change over time, but an advantage of LinUCB is that it's flexible enough to adapt to this situation of changing arms. Now we just need to define what is our context. We know that an item's click probability will depend on which users interact with it and their preferences. So we would like to consider user features as our site information or context. However, millions of users interact with the Yahoo News site, and among these users, there can be users with similar tastes. To be able to share information among users, Yahoo divided users into five clusters or segments of users that could have similar tastes in article categories. They did this by considering certain user data like gender or geographic features, among others. Now, our context vector really represents the membership of users among these five clusters. Let's see a small example of how, in this scenario, data was collected. Let's imagine that users were divided in two segments or contexts, and that one represents users that are younger and the other represents older users. In a first interaction, let's say the algorithm now has to suggest an item for context one, for the younger user. So it suggests article one and the user liked it. So we update D with our context and C with the fact that we got a positive reward. In the second interaction, we got a user that belonged to the second context. In this case, the algorithm also suggested article one, but the user did not like it. We update D and C to reflect the new observations. Because our context X represents a specific user segment and we are building individual models, one per news article, we could interpret that our estimated coefficient theta hat actually estimates how much a particular user group would like a specific news article. The algorithm is implicitly learning user group preference for each article. This version of the algorithm is actually called LinUCB with disjoint linear models. A second version of the algorithm is also proposed where we assume that each arm knows about its features. That is, we have a feature vector called Z that describes news article features and that there is a coefficient vector beta that is shared among all the arms. In this case, Beta would represent item user preferences that are shared among all the user segments. For this variation of the problem, the original paper proposes LinUCB with hybrid linear models. Though we won't be discussing any more details, 
The Yahoo News use case allows us to start thinking about how bandits are used in recommender systems, for example, on how context can influence what we learn, or how we can share knowledge between arms. We now have seen one example of how the ideas behind contextual bandits have been applied to recommender systems. But let's take a step back to first look at how simpler switching bandit strategies can be used for recommender systems to then build up to more complex solutions. Our overall goal is to provide the high level ideas behind a diverse set of examples. Though we really can't be exhaustive, we hope to provide a general picture to help understand how banded ideas can be used in recommender systems. An interesting use case is that of recommending daily deals. These are electronic coupons for deals such as for restaurants and stores. Similar to the news use case, there are cold start challenges as the item base changes frequently and also most of the users tend to be sporadic deal hunters. Lacerda et al. propose an explore then exploit solution to the problem of sending a daily email of deal suggestions to users. The approach consisted of having two phases. In the exploration phase, a fraction of the customers would be sent all the deals of the day. Using gathered feedback, in the exploitation phase, personalized emails would be sent to the remaining customers. The authors proposed methods to identify which would be the best users to select as exploration customers. For instance, it would be convenient to select users that are likely to provide feedback. Also, it would be convenient to select users that are more representative of the larger user base. The trade-off between exploration and exploitation is clear. If we use more customers to explore, more feedback is gathered to later provide better recommendations, but to less customers. A very common setting for bandit-based recommender systems is to consider arms as the items to recommend, the action as a single item recommendation, the context as the user ID or user features, and the reward as the feedback a user has provided to an item recommendation, be it a click, a rating, or any other type of feedback. From now on, we will consider this as the default setup and highlight approaches that differ from this general idea. SEALS proposes the use of an epsilon greedy approach where to exploit an item is recommended based on matrix factorization and to explore a random item is suggested. Considering the sequential nature of the solution and to avoid the computational cost of matrix completion at each step, the approach proposes a mini batch method to update its knowledge about user and item features. The general idea behind this approach can lead to all kinds of combinations between classic recommendation approaches and different types of exploration strategies. Can we do better than random? For example, what if we adopted ideas from active learning to design new exploration strategies? Matrix factorization has also been combined with UCB. Matrix factorization characterizes both items and users on a number of latent factors inferred from user rating patterns. Both Factor UCB and Beware propose UCB type approaches based on estimating ratings with matrix factorization. To guide exploration, these approaches propose different methods to estimate uncertainty over the latent factors in matrix factorization, specifically for new users and new items. For example, Beware takes into account that for a new user, the uncertainty on user latent features is much more important than on item features. To mimic the in-store window shopping experience, Amazon Stream was proposed. The goal was to generate an infinite scroll of items to encourage visual browsing. One of the components towards building Amazon Stream aimed to balance exploration and exploitation. To do this, a Bayesian model was used to estimate an item's click-through rate depending on certain item attributes. Item attributes could be the item's brand, a color, its price, we can think of these estimated click probabilities as our Q values, as our expected reward for recommending an item. The general idea is that the model learns a set of weights, where each weight represents how much a single product attribute contributes to the click probability. As we are in a Bayesian setting, the model not only learns weights, but also uncertainty about those weights. 
To select items to recommend next, Thompson sampling was used. The approach samples each posterior beliefs about our weights. Then sample weights are used to estimate the click probabilities for a candidate item. In the example on the slide, our goal would be to estimate the click probability for the blue jacket given its features X. So we sample from the weight posteriors, so we get some W's, and with those W's, we estimate this click probability for our blue jacket. As more data is observed, we have more certainty about weight estimates. For instance, we might have more certainty about product attributes associated to more popular items. In contrast, undersampled niche items could be associated to attributes that have more uncertain weight estimates. With this in mind, we can interpret the solution as balancing the trade-off between the exploitation of known popular items and the exploration of new items or niche undersampled items. So far, we have talked about solutions that deploy a single bandit, but there are several ways to combine multiple bandit instances as part of a single solution. We can have independent bandits, or we can have multiple bandits that can share information and collaborate. In the Lean UCB paper, among their baselines, the authors also proposed an epsilon greedy segmented and a UCB segmented. In these approaches, an individual user was assigned to its closest cluster or segment, and an independent bandit was run per segment. For example, UCB segmented ran individual copies of a classic UCB bandit per user segment. Surprisingly, for the Yahoo News use case, UCB segmented had a similar performance to the Lean UCB with disjoint linear models. Other solutions that include multiple bandits propose strategies to enable bandits to collaborate among themselves. For example, the cluster of bandits algorithm club builds user clusters based on a graph of user social relationships. The approach proceeds to deploy a bandit strategy per cluster. The user clusters can change over time as the algorithm learns, and the algorithm can move between the case where there is a single bandit for all the users and the case where each user has their own bandit or cluster. In other words, as it learns, it can provide users with increasing levels of personalization. Okay now, but what about top-end lists? Can we recommend lists with bandits? So far, we have only spoken about single item recommendation. We can extend the ideas we have talked about to have bandit-based approaches that can recommend list of items. One way is to run a bandit instance per each ranking position of a top-end list, for example, having a UCB per each ranking or an Epsilon greedy. Each bandit would be responsible of maximizing the received reward for its position. For example, bandit 1 would be responsible for maximizing the number of clicks at position 1. Approaches can differ in the way that they interpret the user feedback to update these independent bandits in the different rank positions. For example, in the rank bandits algorithm, it is assumed that a user scans the items top down and clicks on the first relevant item. So let's assume the user clicked on the item that is in the third ranking position. In this case, the ranked bandits algorithm would provide a reward feedback of one for the bandit at the third position and a feedback of zero for all the other bandits. Another approach is used by the independent bandit algorithm, which gives a reward of one to any item that was clicked in any of the positions. This allows to gather more reward feedback at each play. However, in these approaches, each independent bandit can only learn about one of the items in the list at each particular play. It can only learn about the item that was played in that specific position. Solutions based on multiple play bandits have been proposed to make better use of reward feedback. That is, there would be only one bandit instance and the algorithm at each step can choose multiple arms at the same time to generate the item recommendation list. Last but not least, we can also have a single bandit where each arm represents a recommendation list. For this, combinatorial bandits are proposed, where we can play at each step a set of arms, and this set of arms is usually called a superarm. 
In other words, at each step, the algorithm chooses a superarm to play. Selecting among superarms then becomes a combinatorial problem of the possible, let's say, basic arm subsets. We now hope that you have a general picture of how bandits can be used in recommender systems and that you now have all the fundamentals to start working in this field. In this tutorial, we first introduced classic bandit algorithms. We talked about strategies that explicitly switched between exploration and exploitation. We then introduced the notion of uncertainty and how it could be used to guide exploration in different ways. After this, we discovered approaches could be described with the general ideas of an action value function and an action selection strategy. With these fundamentals, we proceeded to provide examples of how the ideas behind the multiple banded strategies have been applied in recommender systems for both single item and list recommendation. For example, we can switch between a classic recommender approach and an exploration strategy. Also, we can proceed to think about different ways to define uncertainty for classic recommender system approaches and use these notions of uncertainty to guide exploration. We saw how the meaning of an arm and the meaning of context could change between applications. We talked about bandits that offer different levels of personalization, where a bandit can aim to learn features related to individual user preferences, group preferences, or the general preferences of the whole user base. We talked about approaches that required information about user and item features. We also talked about feature-free models, such as matrix factorization. What's more, we learned that multiple banded instantiations could be combined and that they could collaborate to create new solutions. Considering all these use cases and real-world applications, it should be clear that balancing exploration and exploitation for recommender systems is important and that there is a wide variety of combinations of strategies that can result in new bandit-based recommender system solutions. But let's not forget, bandits are a simplification of the full reinforcement learning setting, which opens up the question, are bandits enough? Are bandits enough to fully represent recommender systems as reinforcement learning sequential decision makers that can make long-term plans to reach their goals? There are multiple open challenges in this field, such as risk-aware exploration, dealing with very large action and context spaces, how these strategies could affect different recommender system metrics, such as accuracy, novelty, diversity over time. And also, there are big challenges associated to the evaluation of a bandit-based recommender system. For example, given a data set, what happens if our bandit solution decides to explore items that haven't been rated yet? In general, there is a lot of room for future research in this field. We hope that this introductory tutorial has piqued your interest in bandit-based recommender systems. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to meeting you at the live session.